So uh, let me just make sure uh, my audio is coming through okay, and you guys can see my screen okay. Is that, uh, um, can I get an acknowledgement? Looks good here. Yeah, looking real good. Wonderful. And, and yes, uh, rather than have people try and uh, struggle with pronouncing my name correctly, I sometimes jump in and say, hey, Ed Karthik Prabhakar. Um, it is a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, I think I know a lot of folks here in the community having been uh, part of Tech Era for the last three and a half, um, coming up on four years now, and working with a number of folks across the Kubernetes community on sort of deployments of whether it's networking or network security technologies. And again, the intent here in, in, in the talk today wasn't so much to do a product pitch, right? So I'll, I'll do a quick intro to um, Tech Era as a company and you know what I do. But most of you probably know uh, Tech Era from Calico which is pretty widely adopted in most Kubernetes deployments today. In fact, if you pretty much pick any major distribution of Kubernetes, all of the major hosted cloud provider offerings of Kubernetes, things like EKS, GKE, AKS, IBM Cloud, um, you'll find that Calico comes built in as the default solution for network security and often for networking as well. Right, so having collaborated with a number of these uh, providers, a number of the distribution vendors, uh, and, and most importantly, with organizations who have deployed Kubernetes over the last uh, three, four years, uh, there's a number of things that I've noticed over the last six months to a year that, uh, you know, organizations sometimes have to um, adapt their Kubernetes deployments with the rest of their infrastructure, connecting it to their network, connecting it to their security sort of workflows. And so that's going to be the sort of theme of my talk here today, but I'm going to be a little bit tongue in cheek to the comment earlier, which is I'm trying to keep this a little bit spicy. So I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, highlight a few or spotlight a few things which I'm seeing in, in, in practice. And rather than calling out any particular, you know, customer or, or a deployment, I'm, I'm just going to keep it fairly generic and use a, use a few examples of uh, what I'm seeing in the industry. But what I'm seeing is not necessarily bad, it's just that I'm seeing a lack of awareness of the big picture and why people are doing things the way they are. So that's really going to be the focus of this uh, sort of presentation today. And obviously given the uh, sort of the broader environment we are, we're living in these days, just wanted to call out a plug to a couple of projects. Uh, I'm actually personally not involved with either project, but both uh, Folding at Home and uh, Rosetta at Home have uh, projects running within their sort of distributed computing platform to, um, to help with the COVID, uh, the COVID uh, analysis of the COVID virus, right? And um, there are Kubernetes manifests with nicely packaged uh, Docker containers for uh, running some of these things on your own clusters, if you have spare CPU capacity on some of your Kubernetes clusters. So feel free to take a look and search for, search for these projects. And if you have spare capacity, especially if you have spare GPU capacity on your Kubernetes clusters, I would encourage you to contribute some spare cycles to um, either of these projects. And again, as a disclaimer, I'm not associated with either project, but I just wanted to give a plug for both of them. Now, coming to the sort of theme for the talk, the way I'm going to approach this is rather than focus on any particular product or technology, this is really going to be somewhat product agnostic. This is technology agnostic. I am going to be talking about how we are deploying networking and network security in, in, in the real world, but also to highlight, you know, what are some of the lessons we can take back from, from history? Given that I think what you'll find is a lot of folks who are deploying Kubernetes, a lot of folks who are using Kubernetes, don't necessarily have a deep understanding of how networks are built, how security is built in the network infrastructure. Uh, and having, having been a network engineer in, in, in past jobs, having been a cloud architect and cloud platform uh, architect in past roles, I want to sort of connect the dots for folks in the community here and give a few examples of some of the you know, big picture thinking that we need to, to keep in mind as we go about building and deploying Kubernetes infrastructure, right? So that's the intent. And I have like I, 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 basically four anecdotes, right? And four sort of themes I was gonna to touch on, right? And the first theme I wanna to touch on is that when you look at how people do things, 
they go by what they've learned in the past, things that may or may not be relevant today. And so there's, if you look at, uh, look at this from, uh, you know, how this influences design thinking, some of you might be familiar with this little story here, which is if you, if you think about why are rocket boosters for things like the space shuttle, why do they have the current design? Is, isn't there a more optimal design? And the, the story behind this is that the reason the rocket boosters on things like the space shuttle are designed that way, they have that particular shape, is so that they can be transported on trains from where they're being assembled, whether it's in Utah or, or, or um, Seattle, outside of Seattle, down to Florida, where typically the launches happen. But if you look at you know, how it's being transported on a train, that's actually constrained by the size of the train track. And if you look at the size of the train track, the size of the train track is constrained by, or the reason it, was, it is that particular width is because in the early days of uh, train travel or train track design in, in, in England, uh, there was a lot of focus on you know, leveraging existing tramways to build those train tracks. And that in, in turn was actually influenced by the roads that were constructed in, in England back in medieval times, back in actually Roman times. And those roads were actually designed for Roman chariots. So in effect, a chariot, which typically had two horses that was leading it, helped, design the, helped influence the design of the roads. So in effect, the design of rocket boosters in 2020 is being shaped by design artifacts that were created in the medieval ages. So what's the, what's the story here, right? So let's skip forward to networking. So for those of you who don't have some of the networking history, uh, or maybe some of you do, if you go back to the late 80s and the early 90s and the early days of Ethernet, you know, at, at the time, people used to have these concepts of Ethernet bridges. These were still the early days, right? And we looked at local area networks at the time. Eventually, you had this concept of hubs, and the hubs eventually gave way to things like switches, where every, every connection to every individual desktop was then on a, on a different uh, segment. And obviously, you know, the internet protocol and how the internet evolved typically is based on IP addresses and routing. So typically you had this concept of routers that connect these different uh, ethernet islands to each other. And routers themselves have a tremendous amount of power in terms of how, the, how you design them for scale, right? The concept of being able to use aggregation. When you have IP addresses, how do you have an IP addressing plan so you can create subnets? So these days it's typically ciders, right? where you can create hierarchy and aggregation as you go further up the stack. So someone building a, a backbone design for large numbers of hosts, or large numbers of devices or services, ultimately can use this aggregation and hierarchy to develop a scalable network infrastructure. Now, fast forward to today, when you look at most of the uh, large data centers in, in production, when all of the web scale providers, whether it's a Google, whether it's a LinkedIn, a Netflix, a Facebook, what you'll find is when you look at the network designs that they all use in practice, guess what? There really is no need in, in the current day and age to have a shared layer two segment across multiple servers. What is, is there really a need for a broadcast domain where for an individual node to be able to create a broadcast and then having to deal with how do you protect things like broadcast terms uh, between, between, you know, uh, adjacent nodes of having to deal with things like spanning tree and having a single path. Uh, you know, these are all sort of network artifacts that have gone by the wayside because as you looked at how core networking has evolved in the industry, these are all artifacts that a typical application doesn't need. A typical application needs to be able to send IP traffic. What is the need to have a shared bridge between, you know, two different servers or even within a server, right? And ultimately, so if you look at the actual physical network that has evolved, those designs have evolved to ultimately these days where you actually get the network routing protocol and the IP layer or the layer three, as some of you folks like to call it, all the way up to the server, not even to the switch, not even to the router, but you bring IP and IP routing all the way to the server. That's the current state of how the industry develops networking, right? Now let's compare that with Kubernetes. So what you'll find is today in Kubernetes, we actually reuse some of these abstractions. And then ultimately what Kubernetes does is it, it just provides an abstraction in the case of networking, things like CNI, which allow different vendors to plug in their network implementation. 
applications. And you'll still find a lot of network implementations out there that deal with this concept of a bridge. Going back from 30, 40 years of, uh, you know, of networking history that is no longer actually used in the physical network anymore. And the moment you do that, then you have to start worrying about, hey, what happens if now pod A suddenly decides to spoof its IP address and have tries to attack pod B? They are on a, on a physical bridge talking to each other. So how do you deal with those? And how do you deal with broadcast terms if pod, pod A misbehaves? So again, ultimately Kubernetes, this is not something that Kubernetes forces. It's a matter of the implementation. And you'll find some implementation, like in the case of Calico, for example, it's a pure routed infrastructure. So ultimately every pod, even on the same host talking to each other, goes in via the host namespace. And ultimately you don't have to worry about things like that. But that said, the sort of takeaway from this, and I, as I get to the second um, sort, of, sort of topic and theme I want to touch on, is every abstraction that you use in Kubernetes, don't just take it for what it's worth, especially if it's coming from if it's vendor specific or coming from a, diff, from a specific vendor of uh, solutions, is always look at this and ask why. Why are we doing this? Is there a need to do it this way? Is there a better way to do this, right? And especially if the industry landscape, if the physical infrastructure, if the network infrastructure has evolved past those concepts. Now, if that first theme is that we don't want to just take historical artifacts, the counter to that would be an example where you can say, look, uh, are there lessons to be learned from the past? And do we want to take those forward? Are there reasons certain things were done in the past? And are there some lessons to be learned? And I think uh, what you'll find is with every new generation, we want to start with a clean slate. We think we know better than the previous generations. And we're just going to build something from scratch. And uh, before I get to sort of a couple of examples of that, I want to distinguish between, you know, the concept of encapsulation versus the concept of an overlay. So by encapsulation, what you typically mean is that you are taking an object, in this case, something like a network packet, and encapsulating it in a bigger, in an outer packet, right? So you could take something like IP and encapsulate it in a broader IP packet. You can take IPv4 and cap it in IPv6. You can take Ethernet and cap it in IPv4. So you basically you do that for various reasons. Maybe it's to get the traffic from point A to point B. Maybe the intermediate infrastructure is something that doesn't trust your traffic. So you have to encap it in, in, into the host IP address. So there's various reasons for that. But I want to distinguish that from the concept of an overlay. And specifically by overlay, what I'm referring to is the concept where you build a logical abstraction over an entire network infrastructure. And essentially create, oh, I want to create a separate parallel infrastructure. There might be valid reasons to create an overlay infrastructure. And I'll come back and talk about the example of a service mesh where in effect, what you're doing is you're creating this overlay connectivity paradigm where you're connecting microservices to each other, right? But in effect, you create this layer of a, a virtual abstraction on top of something that is decoupled from a physical or network perspective. Now, the example I'm going to use to illustrate this concept of learning from the past is I'm going to pick on OpenStack. Some of you might be familiar with OpenStack. It is a virtual machine orchestrator providing the ability to launch virtual machines in a cloud-like manner, enabling you know, API-driven access to provisioning uh, VM and cloud instances. Right? And in the early days of OpenStack, there was a focus on, OK, look, how do you what is the purpose of networking? The purpose of networking is to get an IP address to a workload. So if you have a virtual machine, you know, can we use a component called Nova Network to get that virtual machine IP address and get it connected to the network so that people can talk to it. Somewhere along the way, in, in, in like a year or two of, the, of OpenStack's maturity, a couple of vendors, actually one of the vendors had a bright idea to say, well, why don't we just virtualize this and then give end users the ability to create their own virtual network abstractions. So they can create their own virtual routers, the virtual firewalls, the virtual uh, gateways, the virtual networks, and ultimately create these virtual abstractions. And, and you know, in some ways that actually makes sense. But in other ways, if you step back and think about this, a lot of developers, a lot of end users don't really have network expertise, nor do they care to actually go about designing the network. They have an application that needs to talk to another application. 
they need to get an IP address to each application and they need to send those traffics on the wire and get those flows happening in a sufficiently fast manner for so that the application performance is not impacted and there is no connectivity issues. That's typically what a typical developer is looking to do, right? Now, not that this virtual abstraction is, um, is bad, but when you start presenting this to users and then start looking at how do you build the underlying infrastructure to be able to uh, go about enabling this, these uh, connectivity concepts, in effect, if you fast forward a year past that, what, what ended up happening in the OpenStack community with this concept, Neutron is the abstraction that the OpenStack uses for networking, uh, very similar to CNI and Kubernetes. In effect, if you looked at Neutron a year later, this is what the Neutron stack looked like. I've literally borrowed this picture from OpenStack Docs. So here you are, you have your instance, which is trying to send traffic. And to get traffic to flow across the wire to another instance, perhaps on the same node or on a node running right next to it, you have to go through this layers of bridges and re-switches and translations before you get your packet to the instance which is running perhaps on the same server or on a server running next to it. And in fairness to OpenStack and Neutron, this isn't really an issue with Neutron. This is actually an artifact of, or this picture is an artifact of the combination of Neutron with Open Reswitch, which really led to this complexity because you have to deal with the different Open Reswitch bridges and then the fact that you then have to connect them to the, to the uh, in, in, in the case of Linux, there's some uh, the restrictions and so you have to deal with the uh, where do you apply policies at the uh, at the firewall you know at the IP cables layer and so ultimately what you ended up with is this stack. Now as anyone that has managed a network in production, however small or however large, right, as anyone who's actually managed a network will tell you, if something like this goes into production and you have to troubleshoot when things break, you are going to have a fun adventure, right? So the moment you have a, an overlay that starts to have arbitrary flows in random directions before it can get packaged from A to B, you are going to have a little bit of a challenge. Now let's map this onto the microservices world that we live in, right? And fundamentally microservices connectivity at scale is no different from things that, you know, how you connect things to each other over the internet. It's a large network with lots of end systems or end services talking to each other over the network. And uh, for, for those of you who have actually managed a network in, and, and in fact managed large OpenStack, even small OpenStack networks, and had to troubleshoot things like OBS, uh, you know, OBS floor tables in the middle of the night, and especially for those of you, if you just close your eyes and think about a world where you have no IP addresses, you basically are troubleshooting connectivity, looking at MAC addresses flowing through flow tables and having to look at what is flowing where. Guess what? This is not a pleasant thought. And I've actually worked with a number of organizations that have had to struggle with this, ranging from telecom to service provider to enterprises. And ultimately, the sort of uh, takeaway from this is overlays, there's, so we'll come to the concept of service meshes and what is you know, happening in Kubernetes these days but also you have to look at sort of how things like SVN have evolved, right? And is there a reason for creating an overlay? Or is there, are there ways to make your actual network infrastructure do what you need as a application developer, as a platform operator, i.e. get packets from A to B, right? And um, one, one, last, one last thought I'll, I'll leave you with here, is ultimately think about when you go live into production, how many components do you have in your connectivity stack? How decoupled have you made your connectivity stack at your application, at your Kubernetes layer from the people that have to connect those at the physical layer, at the network layer, your network teams? And is there any particular reason that you are trying to work around them then rather than just work with them? As long as you're sending IP packets, they know how to route it from A to B. So is there a particular reason that you want to route your IP packets from A to B via C rather than just picking up whatever path the network provides, right? So again, is there a way that you can work with your network teams to provide that connectivity in an optimal manner? Now, the third sort of uh, theme I'll touch on 
is, I, and, and this is an interesting one because I actually found a couple of examples from, from today to illustrate my point here. A lot of organizations today rely on this concept of a perimeter firewall. So if you look at this from a security perspective, this goes back to 15, 20, 30 years where firewalls were, and a perimeter firewalls were designed as an artifact where let's, guess what? We have this, uh, these applications that are, need to be protected from the internet. So we'll just build a wall around them and then inside everything is wide open and ultimately you have your intranet which is wide open and between your intranet and your internet you have this perimeter firewall which gives you protection so that people can't come in from the outside and attack the soft underbelly of your internal infrastructure. So that was the concept of a perimeter firewall. So looking at a couple of talks that are happened today, I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna pick on Alex as an example. By the way, I think what Alex and uh, uh, a couple of other folks have done is actually very clever and it's not to call what they've done, but it's also really to call out the world we live in, right? So it's not, now the thing that Alex talked about is look, we have problems where we're trying to get connectivity and we're not able to. And he called out the network as the problem. Fundamentally, what he's calling out is not so much the network being the problem, it's the fact that my internal teams doing networking and security are the problem. They are not allowing my services to be accessed from the outside world because they don't trust me. So guess what? The very simple and clever solution that, uh, that he built is to essentially use web sockets to tunnel traffic you know, assuming you have access to a Baskin host on the outside of your perimeter firewall to set up an outbound uh, HTTP connection to it and to be able to tunnel all traffic from the outside through the tunnel back in. Very clever solution, actually very innovative and actually quite useful as well for organizations which are struggling with, and, and organizations meaning the application teams are struggling with being able to get their, their organizations to adapt to their needs. Now, this fundamentally exposes a bigger question, which is in, in as much as the solution that uh, has been built is solving a real problem for the application teams, it also exposes the fact that there is a bunch of pointy head bosses within those organizations who have absolutely no idea and they're living in this false sense of security saying, hey, we have a firewall that's protecting us from the outside world. So we don't have to worry about all those bad malicious actors on the outside. We are secure and that nothing could be further from the truth because guess what? With solutions like inlets and similar solutions, it is really easy to bypass the, the firewall. So what is the purpose of that firewall in the first place? Why do, why do organizations even have it? Because you know, if, if ultimately this is, if it's not really serving a purpose and you have suddenly exposed your internal applications to the outside world, why even bother with a firewall rather than sort of evolving your thinking to newer ways of enabling zero trust networking and zero trust network security, which is ultimately protect your workloads, use, uh, use things like identity to identify your workloads, you, to do mutual TLS, to authenticate each endpoint and to pro usually provide policy authorization together with it. Being able to audit that and do it at an endpoint level rather than having the sort of primitive concept of, of a parameter firewall. Right. So ultimately, what I think um, Alex called out when I was listening to his, his presentation was that we indeed, in this case, we indeed do have a networking problem. But the networking problem is not in the network stack. It's all, maybe it's in the network stack, but it's a layer eight and a layer nine connectivity problem, i.e. it's an organizational problem, right? Uh, and by the way, for those of you who are networking people, when I present a, a seven layer stack, that is a, a, a quick hint to um, start to scratch your head. Do we really have a seven layer stack? Because if, you, if for people who actually are networking people, you'll realize very quickly, we don't have a seven layer stack as is written up in a lot of textbooks with the OSI stack. In fact, for most people who know networking, OSI is actually, uh, it's a very theoretical model. It's actually not used in practice. practice. In the real world, we have maybe a four at best a five layer stack with the TCP IP and the internet stack. You know, Ethernet typically with IP and TCP and then HTTP, right? But fundamentally the problem I want to call out here is the in the real world, 
yes, there are very clever solutions and very elegant and clean solutions from a technical perspective. But don't forget about the fact that, you know, you also have to bring your organization along with you. And just by working around them doesn't give them the ability to understand what's going on. So if and when possible, when you're building an infrastructure, in addition to having to figure out short-term solutions to your problem, also go back and give a thought to, are, are you organizationally doing the right thing? Or are you just bypassing your security team? Are you just bypassing your network team? Would it be worthwhile to educate them on what they're doing being a little bit antiquated and get them to adapt to the modern, modern day and age, right? So that's something I wanna call out as well. And the fourth one is actually a little bit of a pet peeve for me, especially in the last six to nine months as uh, certain technologies have become more widely adopted. But I'm gonna start by talking about, you know, how we've talked about connectivity to Kubernetes, right? And how it's evolved. So obviously in the early days, you know, we had applications talking to each other, clients talking to servers, usually using IP addresses. And as these, as you got to these sort of scaled out models of services, you typically needed to put in things like a load balancer in front of them so that the load balancer can send you traffic to the appropriate workload based on, you know, um, uh, being able to effectively take care of failover if one of those workload, one of those services on the right fails, or even being able to load balance as you get to uh, needing to provide capacity rather than vertically scaling your applications, just have lots of instances of them and have a load balancer take care of the load balancing. And of course, um, along comes Kubernetes, where all of this is uh, done automatically for you. Obviously, every node in your cluster typically has a kube proxy that creates rules and IP tables or IPDS to, or, or BPF uh, to be able to load balance your traffic to different nodes, right? And so kube proxy does that very well for Kubernetes. Now, um, the challenge with uh, kube proxy is that typically the abstractions that kube proxy presents for connectivity to your services from outside would be something like a node port or a load balancer. Uh, typically a cluster IP, a service cluster IP in, in Kubernetes is accessible only from inside the cluster. And so if you need your service to be accessed from outside, you would typically require something like a node port or a load balancer. A node port, people sometimes don't like that because you have a high, a high valued port and then you have to, it just looks ugly, right? So people, if you're deploying it in the cloud, guess what, you can use a cloud load balancer, that's a little bit cleaner. But even the cloud balancer ultimately tends to talk to a node port because ultimately the way that works is it talks to a node port that Kube proxy has created, which then gets it to the workload. So over time, um, people started using ingress for a couple of reasons. One is they use ingress for any sort of layer seven termination, or in, in many cases, organizations also started using ingress as a way for layer three and four load balancing just because they didn't like the concept of using a node port and exposing node ports. And uh, since a cluster IP is not accessible outside the cluster, well, they said, why don't we just use an ingress? So today when I see, look at the deployments of Kubernetes, there's still a lot of deployments that are using an ingress controller purely for as a load balancer and they don't really need the layer seven termination and the layer seven capabilities of an ingress controller. Right. Although in some cases they absolutely do. And because an ingress controller can be a single point of failure, typically what you want to do is you have multiple ingresses and guess what? Suddenly now you have to put a load balancer in front of those ingress controllers. And fast forward to 2020, increasingly you'll find the use of uh, service meshes, you know, whether it is on one ISTE or any, you know, there's a bunch of service meshes, Linkerd being another example, right, in use today. And ultimately when you look at this and step back and look at this picture and think about what is wrong with this picture. How many, if, if you look at this picture, how many load balancers do you think you have in the path? Because fundamentally, if you look at this, what uh, an envoy proxy is doing, what a service mesh sidecar proxy is doing is fundamentally load balancing. It just happens to use the application data and application performance in its load ba balancing decisions but it is fundamentally client-side load balancing where the client services are balancing the traffic to each other. Kube proxy fundamentally is doing load balancing. Ingress is doing load balancing, typically at layer seven, but even often at the network level as well. And then you have a load balancer in front of it. So if you step back and think about this, you need four or five layers of load balancing between your client 
application and your service. And this is where you start to think about this and you go, hmm, is this, are there some optimizations here? Now, in fairness, you'll find that not all of these load balancers go through this part. So as an example, you'll find there are some ingress controllers that bypass Q proxy and use the endpoints API and talk directly to the pod. Uh, there's other optimization and typically in the real world, there's probably 20, 30% of organizations I deal with where the people who are building these clusters understand these constructs and they know what they're doing. But there's a lot of organizations out there, I would say 60, 70% where they say, hey, Kubernetes provides us these six abstractions for connectivity. So we have to use all of them. And that is not the case. Kubernetes provides different abstractions for different purposes. You don't need to use all of them. Each, each abstraction is there for a purpose. So the main thing is, again, you should give some thought to what abstraction is being used and where, and more most, most importantly, why. Now, so really, when you look at this uh, building a network infrastructure, especially at scale, give some thought to what is the path between your services when they talk to each other, when you have not saw traffic from outside the cluster, and really, how are you sending traffic to each other? Increasingly, the, the, the stance I tend to take is if you are indeed going with a service mesh and a service mesh is doing the load balancing for you, the rest of the infrastructure needs to get out of the way and let the service mesh do what it's doing because ultimately, if you look at a service mesh sidecar proxy like Envoy, it is within the pods namespace. It has the intelligence or can get the intelligence from a control plane to be able to program those route rules to do traffic management optimally. And the rest of the stuff in the middle of your infrastructure, especially at the perimeter, needs to get out of the way so that the service mesh can do what it's doing and do it effectively, right? Now, in the interest of, uh, I guess I have a couple of minutes here, um, there are things you can do, and I'm gonna call a call on Calico here because Calico does have the ability to do things like make your service IPs uh, accessible from outside the cluster. And the benefit of that is then with Calico, you can actually make your service uh, cluster IP or your service external IP accessible from outside the cluster. So as an example, if you have two pods that back a given service, that's the Calico will optimally route the traffic just to those two nodes. And uh, in, in fact, Metal LB does something very similar. To illustrate that from a very, really quick demo because of Typically, you know, it's hard to do a talk without having a quick demo to illustrate this. So what I'm going to do is um, first show you a very simple deployment I have. So I'm going to deploy just a simple Nginx application. It's a pretty standard service definition in Kubernetes. And all I'm doing is I'm assigning a service external IP as in, in just the service definition of Kubernetes using this thing called an external traffic policy local which basically tells Kubernetes to only create the node port rules uh, on the specific nodes where there are endpoints belonging to that service. So now if I go ahead and deploy this uh, application, uh, actually before I do that, let me show you. If I go to an instance outside my cluster, uh, or if I look at my, uh, my router that is connecting to my cluster, Right now, there is, uh, you know, basically it's just got my default route for my pod connectivity. And right now I have a service external IP range that is being advertised to all nodes. At my, it's a simple three node cluster in my case. Now let's say I go and deploy this application. And I've deployed this application. It's got three pods in it. As soon as it comes up, notice that these three pods are now running on two different nodes, um, node 11 and node 12. I come back to my routes now and look at this. In effect, what, I've, what Calico has done is made sure that that particular external IP is now routed to just the nodes where that service happens to have endpoints running. So in effect, uh, Calico takes care of routing the traffic to the service IP to just the correct node. And in fact, there are other solutions in the market that do the same thing, Metal LB being a, being a common example. But ultimately what this enables is your service is natively accessible from the outside world. I'm using an external IP in this example. You could do the same sort of uh, capability in Calico with the service cluster IP as well. So your cluster IP is not just a virtual construct within your cluster, your cluster IP is also now accessible from outside the cluster. And the benefit of this is rather than having to rely on an ingress controller for pure network level load balancing, 
why don't you let the network take care of this for you, right? So ultimately, what this, the benefit of this is in effect, when you look at how Kube Proxy deals with this, because the traffic is coming directly to the nodes where Kube Proxy has an endpoint running, Kube Proxy just does a, in this case, it'll be a DNAT to NAT uh, cluster IP or the external IP to the pod IP, but doesn't have to go through an extra hop and doesn't have to go through an SNAT. So it saves the complexity and it also saves network performance because now you're getting your traffic to the appropriate nodes more effectively, but not having to necessarily have an external load balancer. Of course, you can choose to have an external load balancer as well, but ultimately it becomes a design artifact that a cluster operator can decide in terms of what's relevant. So um, let, me, let me sort of pause there and take a couple of questions if you have questions on this, but really the purpose of this talk was not to pitch any product. The purpose of the stock is not to pitch any particular technology, but to provoke some thinking in, in, in organizations as they build and deploy Kubernetes infrastructure. As you do it, as you deploy networking options, networking solutions, you have CNR plugins, things like Calico, things like whatever your vendors are providing you. Don't stop questioning why are you doing certain things and are there lessons to be learned from networking history? Don't lose sight of the big picture. Secondly, absolutely with solutions like inlets and others, they solve some specific problems helping you bypass organizational dysfunction in many cases. But at the same time, don't forget to question that and don't forget to reach out to your network teams, reach out to your security teams, ask them, look guys, your, your, what you have here is your parameter artifacts aren't really serving a purpose. Can, we, can you work with us and, and sort of adapt to the modern day and modern age? And uh, the last one is something uh, that, you know, in, uh, I actually it goes back to some of my early networking classes when I was working with uh, Doug Comer in, uh, in the early days of TCPIP. And there's, there's a moment in the class, and this is goes, best to my, goes back to my very early networking classes, where he'll stop in the middle of this class about TCPIP or routing or whatever, and say, okay, here's something you want to note down because this will help answer everything you need to know about networking. And we'll all bring out our notepads and pens ready to take notes and we'll stop and say, in networking, there is no substitute for thinking. And so when you, do, when you deploy network infrastructure, whether it's for Kubernetes, whether it is for any other infrastructure, pause and think about what you're doing and understand what you're doing rather than just working around what, is, what, um, what might be limitations of your infrastructure, what might be limitations of your organization, and try and solve the problem rather than just adding layers on top, right? So that's the sort of key takeaway I wanna, I wanna leave you guys with. Now, that said, I'm gonna stop and see if there's any questions and uh, hope uh, I've provoked some, uh, some talk. Awesome, yeah, great presentation, thank you. Um, the uh, part about layer eight and nine uh, networking definitely uh, made an impression on me since I've been in uh, environments over the course of my career where we have different uh, multiple you know, tools deployed to do the exact same thing just because this team can't talk to this team and so they all need their own solution. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I used to work at a university and I think they're some of the most notorious criminals when it comes to networking because they just, uh, they're like, well, we have a student who can do this and then like no one else knows how it works ever again. <laughs> the student graduates, yeah. yeah. I think I'll be haunted by that OpenStack slide for some time, <laughs> <I think. laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, I've, I've had to live through that. So I can tell you from first-hand experience, that's about a year and a half worth of nights and weekends I wish I could get back. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, will you be online for questions later maybe? I will be. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Karthik. That was, an, that was a, also great slides. Good work on those. I love well-made slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right.